Hi guys, it's Jubilee and I'm back for another TA review. Um, this week we are going to be covering muscle. So that is um, the fourth and final uh, main tissue type that we haven't covered yet. Um, so yep, let's get started. Um, so some of the general functions of muscle, it does generate contractile forces. Um, so that is one of the special things about muscle. Um, so uh, it does allow for locomotion of multicellular animals, right? Um, so as a multicellular animal, if you don't like the environment that you're in, you have the ability to choose to move out of it, right? You can choose to move somewhere else um, where it's more favorable. Um, and that is your choice due to your muscle, muscle here, skeletal muscle specifically, right? Um, it helps with the beating of your heart, right? So that's specifically your cardiac muscle. Um, that's going to move blood throughout your body, pump nutrients wherever it needs to go, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you have your smooth muscle. Um, and so that helps with the movement of your internal organs. Um, so like your digestive system, a lot of people don't realize it is also in places like your blood vessels. Um, it's in places like your eye, uh, things like that. Um, so a lot of little odds and ends and stuff like that. Um, but yep, that's your smooth muscle as well. So some of the distinguishing features of muscle um, is that it has a high concentration of contractile proteins. Right, so it makes sense that muscle is chocked full of proteins, um, and those special proteins are going to be actin and myosin. Okay, and so actin and myosin are going to work together. Um, they can be arranged either in a diffuse or kind of unorganized pattern in the cytoplasm, or they can be arranged in a very regular repeating pattern called a sarcomere. Okay, and so different types of muscles are going to have. Um, different variations of that um, depending on the type and then all three types of muscle will come from the mesoderm so remember when we were learning about the origins of tissues and stuff like that we had the endoderm mesoderm and ectoderm all three types of muscles are going to come from the mesoderm layer okay so when we are learning about muscle there are three different main types of muscle and um, that is it um, and so we are going to learn about them. So the first one, kind of the most straightforward one uh, that we think about when we think about muscle is going to be skeletal muscle, right? So skeletal muscle is going to be the muscle that you have voluntary control of. It is going to be the muscle that is attached to your skeleton, right? It allows you to move your skeleton around. Um, and so you do have voluntary control over it, okay? Um, so if I want to flex my bicep, I can. If I want to take a step forward, I can. And all of that is with skeletal muscle that I'm doing that. Okay. Another feature of it is that it is striated. So remember we said those uh, proteins, actin and myosin, can be in a diffuse pattern or in a very regular pattern. If they are in that regular pattern, they are going to be striated, okay? So this one right here is gonna be your skeletal muscle. You can see it has these striations, right? These stripes, um, and that is from that regular arrangement of the actin and myosin that gives it that appearance, okay? Another feature of skeletal muscle is it gonna is it is gonna be multinucleated. Okay, so these skeletal muscle cells are very long cells. They actually span the entire length of the muscle, right? So think about a cell going all the way along your let's go with rectus femoris, right? So that's gonna be um, in your quadriceps, in your quads. Um, so that's a long muscle cell right and so it needs a lot of maintenance as well because we're constantly making these proteins replacing these proteins um, so it needs a lot of maintenance and that is why we have multiple nuclei spaced all along the periphery of this skeletal muscle cell okay so it is multinucleate um, and then like I said you'll also notice that the nuclei are along the periphery um, that is to allow for more space in the center of this skeletal muscle cell for that protein okay because it is chocked full of those proteins actin and myosin um, it needs to be strong it needs to be fast it needs to be regular um, so all the nuclei are kind of pushed off to the side and they just kind of stay there and maintain the cell Okay, so these are very long cells. They have what we call a triad. 
that allows them to um, send their contractile signal. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the PowerPoint. Um, and then another feature of skeletal muscle is that it will fatigue. Um, and that does make sense, right? So if I wanna lift um, something super heavy, I cannot do that for the rest of my life, right? I will get tired. If I wanna flex my bicep, I can do that. That's all well and fine, but I will get tired. It will fatigue um, and there will be a point where I cannot do that anymore um, and my uh, muscles will fatigue, okay? Cardiac muscle is gonna be our next type. Um, it is involuntary and that does make sense, right? If I had to sit there and I had to decide every time I wanted my heart to contract and pump blood throughout my body, I would get exhausted I would forget about it, I would get tired, and when I went to sleep for the very first time, I would die because I would forget to contract my cardiac muscle, right? So it's good that it's involuntary. I don't have to think about it for it to continue happening. It is striated, so this is gonna be our cardiac muscle cell. So remember we said that striated means that it is in those regular repeating units. That actin and myosin is arranged in a regular repeating pattern. Um, and it is mononucleate mononucleate meaning there is only one nuclei in a singular cardiac cell okay unlike our skeletal muscle and then some more features of it is that they are branched cells with intercalated discs so here you can see how this one cell is branching off branching off um, across and forming these intercalated discs on the end we'll talk more about that in a second but that's basically what allows this cardiac muscle cell to communicate with the cell right next to it okay um, and that does help with the synchrony of cardiac muscle right because your heart pumps all at once all at once all at once Okay. Um, smooth muscle is going to be the last one that again is involuntary, right? And that's also a good thing because if I had to sit there and think about every time I wanted a certain portion of my gut to move and another certain portion of my gut to relax, I would not do a very good job of that, right? So it is involuntary. It does it for itself. I don't have to think about it. It is non-striated, so that's different than our other two. Right? And so that means that the actin and myosin are not arranged in regular repeating units. They're actually arranged diffusely all throughout the cytoplasm. So it doesn't create this special cool looking stripy pattern, okay? Non-striated. It is mononucleate. So there's only one nucleus within here. And then it is spindle shaped. Okay, so spindle shaped kind of means that it's wider in the center and it kind of tapers down to a point at the end. Um, that spindle shaped and then it is slower to contract okay and that is kind of because it is non striated right these proteins aren't rain aren't arranged in a very regular manner um, so it does kind of take a while to get the ball moving and everything like that and that's totally fine right because um, if I want a certain part of my gut to move I really don't care if it does it now or if it does it in five seconds right Whereas if I want my heart to contract, I care if it happens now or in five seconds. If I want to jump away from something and use my skeletal muscle, I care if it happens now or in five seconds, right? Not so much for my smooth muscle. So it's a lot slower to contract. I don't really care about it. That's cool. Um, and then it will not fatigue. Right, so just like your cardiac muscle, it will not fatigue. Um, and that is good because you do need certain parts of your digestive system to constantly stay contracted, right? You need certain parts of other smooth muscle cells to constantly stay contracted um, and not have to think about it, okay? Um, so now we're gonna look at some real histologic samples. So first we're gonna look at smooth muscle. Um, remember we said smooth muscle is for movement of internal organs, so things like your digestive system, your GI tract, your blood vessels, um, there's a bunch of other examples, but mainly things like that, right? And so remember, these are the questions that we want to answer in regards to smooth muscle. Okay, so is it voluntary or involuntary? Hopefully you remember smooth muscle is involuntary. It is non-striated. It is mononucleate and it will not fatigue okay and then we're gonna look at these examples um, and I will tell you one of the things that people get confused with with smooth muscle is they confuse it with fibroblasts 
right? Because remember, we just kind of learned about fibroblasts. They are kind of spindle shaped. They're these kind of flat looking cells um, with a nucleus and kind of pink stuff around it, right? Here is a smooth muscle cell and I can see how you would get these confused, okay? The main thing that I tell people is remember when we learned about fibroblasts, we said that the pink stuff around the fibroblast is collagen and we said that that fibroblast is producing collagen extracellularly meaning it is producing this collagen but this collagen is not within the cytoplasm of this cell right this collagen is outside of the fibroblast cell membrane okay when we talk about smooth muscle the pink stuff around a smooth muscle cell is going to be those proteins actin and myosin right that's going to be the main kind of pink thing around the smooth muscle are those proteins, actin and myosin. And when we think about those proteins, actin and myosin, those are going to be within the cell, intracellular, right? So intracellular versus extracellular. So this is a fibroblast, and you can see all this pink stuff around it, that is not within a cell, that is extracellular. These are smooth muscle cells. All this pink stuff around it is within a cell, okay? is within a cell. So these cells are a little more bubbly. Um, they don't have as much white space kind of around them, this kind of artifact space. Um, and that is because um, all of this is extracellular, right? And all of this is within a cell. So it's a lot more filled up, okay? There's a lot less free space around these smooth muscle cells, okay? Um, and then, um, so there's some more smooth muscle cells in there. Um, and then I will show you, so this is kind of the different views you'll have of smooth muscle. So here you can see this is more of a longitudinal cut of smooth muscle where we've cut it um, along its length. And so you can kind of see the whole cell very well, especially this one, right? That smooth muscle cell. Here, this is where we've done kind of a transverse cross section cut, right? So we've cut it along um, like this way, right? Up and down. And so you can't see the whole length of the cell, but you can see um, down its cross section. So sometimes you can see the nucleus, right? If we cut straight through the middle, sometimes you can't, like if we cut right here through this cell, okay? But this is it at a cross section and we'll see smooth muscle in both forms and you still need to know that this is smooth muscle and this is smooth muscle, okay? So here, this kind of exemplifies what I was talking about. Um, so here you can see this is smooth muscle in the ureter. Um, and remember, in the ureter, you know, we still have connective tissue. Okay, so this is going to help you differentiate between smooth muscle and connective tissue, those fibroblasts in connective tissue, because I know a lot of people get confused. So here you can see all of this right here. This is all connective tissue, right? So these are all fibroblasts. These are fibroblasts that are producing collagen, okay? And the collagen is that pink stuff that you see in between the fibroblasts. Right here, this is a bundle of smooth muscle. This is a bundle of smooth muscle. This is a bundle of smooth muscle. In between all of that are little strands of connective tissue, right? Strands of connective tissue. But this is a bundle of smooth muscle, smooth muscle, smooth muscle, smooth muscle. Right, so hopefully this will show you how you can differentiate, right? This is all smooth muscle up and down here. Lots of smooth muscle. This is smooth muscle. This is smooth muscle. Hopefully you can see how you can differentiate between smooth muscle and connective tissue. Okay, so kind of get used to that because it is tricky. I will admit that um, it is tricky. It's a bunch of blue, I mean a bunch of pinky, you know, stringy stuff floating around here. Uh, but there is a difference. Okay, so kind of get used to that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about smooth muscle in the intestines, right? Um, so remember we said smooth muscle does help move things along in the intestines. Um, so in the intestines, and we'll learn more about this when we learn about the digestive system, uh, but quickly we're gonna kinda go over some examples of smooth muscle. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is the muscularis externa in the intestines. So the muscularis externa, that basically means like muscle layer externa on the outside, right? So it's the outermost layer of muscle. So this right here is going to be the outermost layer of muscle. If we go up towards this way, that's going more towards the inside of the intestine, more towards the lumen of the intestine. This is more towards the outside, the outer wall. So this is the muscularis externa, 
okay and a lot of people get confused they'll tell me just this is the muscular sex turner they'll tell me just this is the muscular sex turner but it is the whole thing okay the muscular sex turner is made up of two layers um, and you'll see here on the zoom in so one layer is smooth muscle that's going longitudinally right remember we said we can cut smooth muscle in different directions so this is where we're cutting it along the length of that smooth muscle Right here, this is another layer. It's also smooth muscle, but this is a cross section. So the smooth muscle is actually coming out at you and into the page. Okay, so these smooth muscle cells are going in different directions. This one's going back and forth longitudinally. This one's coming out at you and into the page. And those are both the muscular sex turn. They just go in different directions from each other because it helps the smooth muscle contract the intestine in different ways to help move along food. Okay, so that is important for peristalsis or the movement of ingesta through the digestive system. Okay, the next kind of little chunk of smooth muscle we're going to talk about is going to be the muscularis mucosa. Muscularis mucosa, and so that is going to be much thinner. It's going to be this tiny little darker purpley blue strip right here, right? So this little strip that goes all the way along um, the intestine that's going to be the muscularis mucosa okay and as you can see it's not as big right it's definitely not as thick so it's not going to be as strong so the muscularis externa is in charge of squeezing and contracting and moving and gesture through the whole intestine um, what this layer is going to do is it's actually going to move the little microvilli in the small intestine Okay, so in the um, intestines, you have little microvilli, so little finger-like projections, so that's these things up here, um, and they're kind of moving around and stuff like that, and that's to increase the surface area in small intestine, right? And so in order to move them around, uh, move things on the surface of the microvilli and move the microvilli itself, we do need muscle. And so this is that layer of smooth muscle that's going to do that, the muscularis mucosa. Okay. Um, and again, both of these are smooth muscles, so they're involuntary, it's non-striated, it's mononucleate, it's spindle-shaped, right? Stuff like that. Make sure you know that. So here you can see smooth muscle in an EM, right? And so here's my question. How do you know that this isn't a fibroblast, right? So this is the nucleus of the cell, right? This is kind of the, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, sorry, plasma membrane of the cell. So how do I know that this isn't a fibroblast? Um, the way I know is because remember all of this protein right here, all this protein is within the cell, right? Not extracellular, within the cell. There's a lot of protein in here um, going on. There's a lot of actin and myosin, right? So this is a smooth muscle cell, not a fibroblast cell. Okay, um, the nuclei is also a lot less condensed than in a fibroblast, but yeah. And then are these diffuse or regular arrangements of actin and myosin? I'll tell you right now, they're diffuse, right? Remember we learned that that's why it's non-striated. So there's a bunch of actin and myosin in here, but they're not arranged regularly. And when you see um, an example of them when they are arranged regularly, you'll see the difference. Okay, and we'll see that in a second. So here you can see this is more smooth muscle, right, more smooth muscle. Here is actually a um, synapse, so this is where a little nerve ending is ending on this smooth muscle cell um, to tell it, hey, I want you to contract now, hey, I want you to relax now. Um, so it's a little synaptic site right there. Uh, but yeah, this is a smooth muscle cell, and here you can see all the actin and myosin, they're arranged diffusely. There's no really regularity to this smooth muscle cell. Here you can see more smooth muscle cells. You can see they're kind of spindle shaped. And again, you can see that the cytoplasm, the pink stuff, it is within the cytoplasm, right? It's within the cell, unlike in a fibroblast. And, and then here's some more examples of that very spindle shaped smooth muscle. Okay, so now we're going to go to skeletal muscle. Uh, remember, skeletal muscle is responsible for locomotion of multicellular animals. Um, so think gains, um, think your biceps, um, the beginning of your esophagus, right? You can choose when to swallow. You can choose how to move your tongue, um, stuff like that. You can choose where to move your eyes. Um, anything you can voluntarily choose I promise is skeletal muscle, 
I promise it's the only muscle that is voluntary. So, um, skeletal muscle, are they? They're voluntary, right? They are striated, right? Meaning we have regular repeating units of actin and myosin. Um, they are multinucleate, right? Remember we said there are multiple nuclei because these skeletal muscle cells are really big, okay? And then do they fatigue? Yes, your skeletal muscle fatigues. You cannot sit there and flex your bicep for as long as you want, I promise, okay? Um, also notice the nuclei are on the periphery, right? We already talked about that, not the center. And here you can really see what I was talking about, right? You see how there are these stripes in the skeletal muscle going up and down, these stripes of dark and light and dark and light, dark and light and dark and light, right? That is that striation I was talking about. That is that actin and myosin lining up in this very regular way. And what that does is it makes it more efficient for them to contract um, and we'll look at that in a little more detail in a second, okay? But here again, remember, we can cut things at a longitudinal view or a cross-sectional view. So here is a longitudinal view of a skeletal muscle cell. We're cutting it along its length, but if we cut it at a cross-section, this is what we're going to see, right? So a big chunk of protein, and we'll see those nuclei on the periphery, right, on the sides. So here is a longitudinal view of skeletal muscle. Here is a cross-sectional view. Okay, and you can see um, the nuclei are pushed off to the periphery, right? Just like we said, they are. Okay, so here you can see again, right? We've got the nuclei on the periphery. We've got those striations. This is skeletal muscle. Um, here, this is skeletal muscle, and you can see this is actually a little nerve axon going out, um, and it's connecting with these skeletal muscle cells on that little synaptic site. Okay, so these are those little synaptic sites. This is where that nerve ending is meeting with that skeletal muscle cell and saying, hey, I want you to contract now, um, or I want you to relax now. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the sarcomere, and this is what a lot of you guys tend to get really stressed out about because it is really complicated, okay? It is really complicated, and there's a lot of physiology to it. I don't want you guys to get too bogged down in the details, so I will try to go over it um, and simplify it a little bit, okay? So we're going to talk about the sarcomere, and remember we said the reason skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are striated is because they have these regular repeating units of actin and myosin, right? And so the way that this actin and myosin arrange themselves are in these repeating units called the sarcomere, okay? So one sarcomere is one little unit, one little repeating unit within a skeletal muscle cell, okay? Um, and so here you can see we've got actin and myosin. Um, so you can see here are these little actin filaments right here and here are going to be these little myosin filaments the darker ones in the middle and so you can see what happens is this actin interweaves with the myosin right so there's this one area where the myosin and the actin overlap there's an area where there's just myosin and there's an area where there's just actin and what happens is when this muscle cell wants to contract the actin and myosin will kind of pull on each other and pull themselves closer together so that um it's being, this actin is being pulled inwards this way, this actin is being pulled inwards this way, and overall what it does is it shortens the length of this sarcomere. It shortens the length of this sarcomere. And so when you do that with the whole skeletal muscle cell, it shortens the length of that skeletal muscle cell, it shortens the length of that muscle, um, and that's how you get contraction. Okay, and it can get a lot more complicated than that. I really don't want to overwhelm you guys with the details. Um, you know, I could spend two weeks teaching you all of this, um, and we have one week, and this is just a little chunk of it. Okay, so don't stress out too much. Um, I will tell you, these are some of the terms that we use uh, to describe a sarcomere. So when we talk about the A band in a sarcomere, the A band is the portion of a sarcomere that on light microscopy appears dark and the right the way I remember that is dark has an A okay what it really means is it's anisotropic um, you know don't really worry about what that means but the A band is dark okay so this is going to be the A band and really what it is is it's the portion that has myosin in it okay 
the I band is going to be light or isotropic, okay? So it's going to be the portion of the sarcomere that is light, okay? Um, and that basically means the portion of the sarcomere that doesn't have the myosin in it, just has the actin, okay? Z disc, a Z disc is going to be the line between adjacent sarcomeres, okay? So this whole thing is a molecule, uh, so this whole thing, you know, is a bunch of actin. Um, and where, um, so that lines up with right here. Um, and so where that kind of unit repeats again um, and connects to another chunk of myosin is going to be a Z band. So it's kind of like this anchoring portion of the actin, okay? And so from one Z disc to another Z disc is one sarcomere, okay? From one Z disc to another Z disc is one sarcomere, okay? But remember, all of this is actin and it overlaps with the myosin. All of this is myosin and it overlaps with the actin, okay? So um, in the Z disc is, um, yeah, I, I don't want to get into too many details with you guys. Um, and then another thing is the H band. So the H band is this space where the actin um, is not present, right? So where it's just myosin. So you can see here the actin ends right here and it ends right here. So this space in between is going to be the H band, okay? And as you can imagine, if I'm moving this actin in towards the middle, moving this actin in towards the middle because the myosin and actin are grabbing each other and pulling each other in, this H band is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller because these molecules are going to be moving closer and closer together. So um, as the muscle stretches, the H band gets wider. As the muscle contracts, the H band gets smaller. Okay, and that's about all you need to know about that. But yeah, there's the H band. So it's this little break in the A band where there's no actin, just myosin. Okay, so here you can see this, right? So if I look right here, this darker portion, if I were to ask you what this darker portion is, hopefully you would say it's an A band, this lighter portion, I band, right? And so here you can see kind of a diagrammatic view of how it's moving, right? So this is what we were looking at before, okay? You've got your A band, you've got your I band, you've got your Z disc, you've got your H disc, okay? And if this muscle decides to contract, it's going to move this actin more towards the middle, right? And these actin molecules are going to meet in the middle. That's going to shorten the length of the muscle. That's going to result in contraction, right? Squeezing of that muscle. Um, and that H band is going to disappear, right? Because now there's, there's actin all throughout here, right? Before there was a little break of actin. And if I stretch that muscle, these little actin molecules are going to get further and further apart. So this H band is actually going to get bigger. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. And then now we're going to look at an EM of that. So hopefully you can tell this darker band right here is an A band. This lighter band right here is an I band. If I go from right here, one, this is a Z disc to another Z disc. This whole thing is one sarcomere, right? So in the middle of an I band is a Z disc. In the middle of an A band is an H band. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Okay, so now we're going to talk about cardiac muscle. Remember, cardiac muscle is also striated. So all, everything that I was talking about with the sarcomere is also present in cardiac muscle. Remember, that's important for the beating of our hearts, right? So moving of blood and nutrients, everything like that. Um, that all kind of occurs due to that big old pump that is your heart, okay? When you think about cardiac muscle, hopefully you know that it is involuntary, right? You cannot choose when to pump and when to not pump your heart. Um, it is striated, so it does have sarcomeres. Um, it is mononucleate and it does not fatigue, right? Your heart will not stop pumping unless there's something wrong with it. Normally, it will not stop pumping. It will not fatigue. Um, what else do they have that's special? So remember, we talked about intercalated discs and lipofusin granules. Um, I'll show you that in a little better detail in a second. Um, but here you can see, so remember, so 
um, these are those cardiac muscle cells and remember they are branched so they kind of branch out and they create these little separations called intercalated discs so these are those intercalated discs and what that allows is for one cardiac muscle cell to touch multiple other cardiac muscle cells on this side multiple on that side so it allows them to all kind of touch each other hold out their hands um, and hold everybody else's hand so everybody's kind of in communication with each other okay so that's what these intercalated discs do they kind of allow for the uh, signal of one cardiac muscle cell to go to another um, and when you think about that that makes sense right because if I tell this one cardiac muscle cell to contract and it does that what good is that going to do for your heart right it's not going to do very much good if one little cardiac muscle cell is contracting that is not going to create the force needed to pump blood throughout your entire body right so if I'm going to tell one of your cardiac muscle cells to pump to contract I want every single other cardiac muscle cell in that group to do it at the same time right so they have these special intercalated discs so they can talk to each other and say hey dude I'm contracting so you better do it too hey dude this guy's contracting so you better do it too so everybody contracts at the same time so when your heart beats it's this very sudden bump 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 right um, and you know if we get into the details it's separated into chambers right so your chambers pulse at different times right so it becomes a bump 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 I don't want to get into too many of the details though so don't overwhelm yourself with that okay so those are those intercalated discs another thing that they have is lipofusin granules so that's this right here you see this kind of orangish granularity within the cytoplasm in the cells it's not always present but it can be present in an aged old heart Okay? And basically what it does is it just indicates that there's a long-lived cell, right? That this cell's been here a while, it's seen everything, done everything, um, it's an old little fart. Um, and so what it is, is it's like the buildup of lysosomes that haven't digested everything within that lysosome, right? Um, so it's just indigestible material that kind of builds up within that cell. Basically what it means is it just indicates that this is a long-lived cell, okay? This is an aged cell. So here is an EM of cardiac muscle. And so remember this is striated, right? So we've got your A band, your H disc, your I band, your Z disc, right? This from one Z disc to another disc, Z disc, that's a sarcomere, right? So it's, it's a lot of the same as skeletal muscle. Another thing that you'll notice is there's this big kind of ziggity zaggity thing, right? Interrupting everything, this big kind of ziggity zaggity thing. This is an intercalated disc. Okay, so this is the connection of one cardiac muscle cell to another, right? So this ziggity zaggity thing, this is how they talk to each other and they say, hey dude, we're contracting over here, you better get on it or you'll be behind and left out and sad. Okay, so this is um, talking more about that. So here you can see those lipofusin granules uh, more up close. So it's this kind of granularity that they see. Um, and it is just kind of leftover stuff that didn't get digested properly, so it just kind of builds up. Okay, so remember we said that um, these cardiac muscle cells, it's important for them to all contract at one time. Part of the way that they do that are those intercalated discs. Um, there's a lot of ways that they achieve that actually. But another way that they do that are these Purkinje fibers. So this is kind of what sets the pace for your heart. It tells your heart, hey, we're going to beat at 60 beats per minute right now. Hey, we're going to beat at 100 beats per minute right now. It tells them, hey, this is what we want to do. Um, and so that's what these are called Purkinje fibers. So this is special to your heart. So all of this, oops, all of this is cardiac muscle cells, right? This right here, these big kind of crazy looking cells that are really bubbly and stuff, these are Purkinje fibers. So this is nervous tissue or a special kind um, and basically what it does is it conducts a pulse okay so these are excitable cells that are basically like a metronome so they set themselves off at a regular pace okay so this SA node it knows exactly when it wants to go it's a metronome every 60 beats per minute it's gonna set itself off okay unless it's affected by other things then it's gonna decide okay right now every 100 beats a minute I'm gonna set myself off and it's going to send this signal in a very organized way all throughout the heart, 
Okay, so it travels down to the atrioventricular node. It travels down to the Purkinje fibers. So that's what these are right here that you can see on histology. Um, and these Purkinje fibers are going to spread all throughout the heart. And that's going to help propagate the signal to tell all of these cells, we are contracting now. Get on the page. Get on the same page as us because we're doing it. Okay, so this is how the heart can do that because it's not going to be helpful if this one little part of the heart contracts all at once and then this little part of the heart contracts all at once. We want it to be a whole big ba bam This whole part of the heart contracts all at once. This whole part of the heart contracts all at once. We want it to all be at the same time. So that's why we also have these Purkinje fibers. So that really helps because yes, they have those intercalated discs and that helps. But you can imagine how it would still take a while with just intercalated discs to get all the way from here to here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about dyads and triads. Um, and so what that is, is this is yet another way for your muscle cells to propagate their signal um, and allow cells to contract all at once. Right, because remember, in one single muscle cell, um, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, we have multiple sarcomeres. Right, multiple sarcomeres in one skeletal or cardiac muscle cell, but we want them all to contract at the same time. The way we do that is through dyads and triads. So what they're composed of is a sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what the sarcoplasmic reticulum does is it regulates calcium release. So it is a big calcium storage pool. Calcium, believe it or not, is needed for contraction of these actin and myosin proteins. Okay. So what it does is it's going um, to whenever the sarcoplasmic reticulum decides, okay, I've been told to release calcium, it's going to release it. And that's what's going to allow the actin and myosin to contract, okay? And what tells the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium is going to be this thing called the T-tubule, okay? And what the T-tubule does is it allows that signal to penetrate deep within the cell, right? Because if you think about it, if the sarcoplasmic reticulum is just on the cell surface, way out here, and then there's a little signal that says, hey, release calcium, yeah, a bunch of calcium is going to get released up here, but what about down here? There's not going to be any calcium released in the center of the cell, and we need that portion of protein to contract too. We need those actin and myosin um, units to contract too. So what it does is the sarcoplasmic reticulum makes a little like divot down in the cell membrane, and the T-tubule follows it. So the T-tubule um, propagates that signal so that the signal goes all the way down here and it tells this sarcoplasmic reticulum, hey, release all your calcium. Hey, release all your calcium. Hey, release all your calcium. So whenever this transverse tubule transmits that signal, we get calcium release all throughout the cell so that all of these units can contract at the same time. Okay, so that's what allows for your skeletal muscle and your cardiac muscle to be faster in action, right? So if I tell your skeletal muscle, hey, I want it to contract now, it'll do it and it'll do it fast. And this helps with that, okay? Um, the only difference is in cardiac muscle, you have a dyad. In skeletal muscle, you have a triad. Basically what that means is a dyad is composed of one T-tubule and one sarcoplasmic reticulum going down into the cell at a time, okay? A triad is composed of one T-tubule and two sarcoplasmic reticulums going down into a cell at a time. So here you can see there's one a T-tubule and another sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there's three things total in a triad. There's two things total in a dyad, All right? Does that make sense? Um, and the way I remember which is which is in cardiac muscle, if you do not have cardiac muscle, you will die, right? If your heart cannot pump, you will die, so it has a dyad. In skeletal muscle, if you want to contract your skeletal muscle, you need to try, right? You need to put in effort because it's voluntary, so in skeletal muscle, you have a triad. That's how I remember it. Okay, so you can only see these kind of dyads and triads in EMs, so here you can see this is Remember, we see this intercalated disc, so I already know this is cardiac muscle. 
right? I know cardiac muscle has a dyad, but here you can see, right? So this is pointing to a T tubule and then the little black line next to it, sarcoplasmic reticulum. T tubule, sarcoplasmic reticulum, together they make a dyad, okay? Here you can see this is a T tubule with sarcoplasmic reticulum on either side, so that's gonna be a triad, right? So as a whole, it's a triad. Here you can see as a whole is a triad. So there's a T tubule in the middle, sarcoplasmic reticulum on either side. Um, and so since these are triads, they're gonna be in our skeletal muscle. Okay, so now we're gonna do some practice. Um, so here we go. This is one in the, sm the intestines, the small intestine specifically. So which images is not slash are not composed of long spindle shaped smooth muscle cells? Okay, so we're looking for smooth muscle. Um, remember, we kind of already went over this. So A, remember we said that this long little kind of darker strip in here um, that's kind of thin and tiny, this is smooth muscle. And this is that muscularis mucosa, right? If we look at C, remember we said this whole layer right here, this is smooth muscle. And remember we said this is muscularis externa, right? This one right here, remember, we didn't talk about this being smooth muscle. This is actually the same as this right here. It's just cut different. This is just the, the deep part of those villi, okay? So this is the same as this. Um, it's just the way that it's cut weird. Um, this is kind of, it's the crypt is what it's really called. It's just the bottom of those villi where it meets the rest of the tissue. Um, so he's trying to be tricky here, but no, this is not smooth muscle. This is epithelium actually. Okay. So B is the only one that does not match. Okay. Which images best match the stated functions of muscle? Hopefully this one's pretty straightforward. So A in the picture here, this is cardiac muscle. Remember, cause it's mononucleate, it's striated, it's branched. Um, so your cardiac muscle is not responsible for locomotion, right? It doesn't move you around. That would be skeletal muscle that does that. B, so this is a picture of skeletal muscle, right? It's striated, it's long and huge. Um, it's multinuclear and the nuclei are on the periphery. Um, so it is not in charge of the beating of their hearts. Remember that is cardiac muscle. So these two are actually switched. C, movement of internal organs, um, and C is a picture of smooth muscle, so yes, that does match. Your answer would be C. Okay, here we go. The following EM contains which of the following? Um, so sarcomere, yes, it contains a sarcomere, right? Because this is obviously striated, striated muscle, right? You can see this repeating pattern, and remember this repeating pattern is called a sarcomere, so this line right here in the middle of an I band, and this line right here in the middle of an I band, these are our Z discs or Z lines. And so from one Z line or Z disc to another is one sarcomere, right? So it does contain sarcomeres. A triad, so that's tricky. The way I would go about solving this is I would decide, is this skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, right? Because it's obviously striated, but here you can see, remember I said this crazy looking thing kind of jig-jagging along. This is an intercalated disc, right? And remember we said intercalated discs are specific to cardiac muscle, right? So if this is cardiac muscle, it will not have a triad, it will have a dyad, okay? Another way you can look at it is, yes, there's just one T-tubule and one sarcoplasmic reticulum, two things in total, that's a dyad. So B is false. C, we already said this is cardiac muscle because it has that intercalated disc, so that would be wrong as well. The only one that would be right would be A. Okay, this one, which is slash are characteristics of T tubules in striated muscle? So A, allows the action potential of the plasma membrane to reach deep within the cell. Yes, that is correct. Remember we said that's what the T tubule does, is it allows this signal, the action potential, to dip down into the cell, deep into the plasma, rem in, deep into the cell, um, and spread the message, hey, we're contracting right now all throughout the cell. So yes, that is what a T-tubule does. 
Um, another thing it does is tells the sarcoplasmal reticulum when to release calcium. Yes, that is how um, it sends that signal, right? So it sends the action potential deep within the cell and what that action potential, what that signal is doing, the signal says, hey, sarcoplasmal reticulum, release your calcium. So that's what's going on there, okay? And then see the dyad is composed of a T tubule and one portion of sarcoplasmic reticulum. Yes, that is correct. Remember, because we said a dyad is made up of two things, so one T-tubule and one sarcoplasmic reticulum, all of the above would be correct. Okay, hopefully that was helpful. Um, I know there's a lot for you guys to learn every week, so there's no way I'm ever going to be able to cover it all. I do try to keep these reviews under an hour or about 45 minutes for you guys. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out, ask your TAs, attend help desk, attend class. We are here to help you guys. Um, but yeah, other than that, good luck with your quiz.